and welcome to our Pinnacle Live series on mind battles. We will be continuing our time together with the topic, Rewire Your Brain. So if you've been following us for the past couple of weeks, Pastor Josh and Pastor Edwin gave beautiful messages. Uh, Pastor Josh with the introduction uh, two weeks ago and Pastor Edwin on the topic of how to remove the lies that we, that we find ourselves believing in and choosing to replace them with the truth. Now I know Paul, as a community and as a village, um, it's understandable for us to really see mental health as a very difficult topic to talk about. I think many of us, if not all of us, at one point in our lives feel kind of uneasy talking about the state of our thought life. But I remember there was a, a, a quote from Tim Ferriss, and he was saying, oftentimes the pace of our growth is determined by the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. If you want to go and grow, and be a better person, and, and for us in our case, deepen in our relationship with God, and deepen in our relationship with our community, then we must be willing to have uncomfortable conversations. And uh, I know for, for many of us, this topic is not an easy one to talk about, but I'm, as part of the next generation, I'm so thankful that this is um, a, a, an issue or, or a topic that we as a church will be diving into. So, I think what's so interesting po, about our minds is that we look at our minds as a place of total privacy. We feel that our thought life is a place where no other person can invade. However, if we are not careful, thoughts of fear, thoughts of lust, thoughts of greed, thoughts of revenge, of jealousy, of anger, and, an en and envy can run around in our minds unchecked. And I think many of us, but we know that experience of what it's like to constantly fixate on a certain thought. We know what it's like to constantly fixate or obsess or dwell in certain thoughts that we know lead to destructive actions, destructive choices, and destructive behaviors. And pretty soon, you find yourself in what you call a rut. And I remember Brooke Figueroa, she created an acronym. She's um, uh, a pastor, one of uh, the pastors of Mosaic, and she was, she was talking about what it means to get stuck in a rut, and she made this acronym, and the acronym for is this. RUT stands for Routine Unproductive Thinking. Yeah. Routine Unproductive Thinking. On side, how many of you here, you know what it's like to be stuck in a rut? No one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> we have a few hands on site. Where you see, it's this point in our life where you are thinking the same thoughts, you're doing the same things, and you're experiencing the exact same problems. I want you to think about that sentence for a little bit. You're thinking the same thoughts, you're making the same choices, and because of the choices that you're constantly and repeatedly making, you're experiencing the same problems. And it's this vicious cycle and I think many of us know what it's like to be kind of stuck in a rut where you are kind of being forced to experience the same things over and over and over again. And maybe for some of us, these are some experiences that you can relate to. Certain habitual thinking that has led us to say, I'm going to commit to stop fighting with my spouse. I'm going to commit to stop fighting with my sibling. I'm going to commit to stop fighting with my family member. I need to stop arguing with this person because it's causing chaos in our family and it's affecting other people. And you say that you'll stop fighting with this person, but then you keep doing it. Or you freak out when you see your credit card bills, but then you continue to buy things that you don't need with money you don't have. Ah, some laughter. <laughs> so you know what it's like, right? You know, you panic, you're freaking out, the bills are not, this is not what it's supposed to be, but you keep buying things that you don't need. Or maybe you can relate to the experience of overthinking and overworrying, even when you know it doesn't help. Or maybe you're the type of person that you're saying, I'm going to finally commit to forwarding my physical health. I'm going to finally commit to pinnacle fitness but then the next day, you stop by your local portos and you tell yourself, it's been a long day of work, I deserve this cheese roll, right? It's been a long week. If the people around me only knew what I've been through, I deserve this chocolate croissant, right? <laughs> and so these are just some experiences that 
kind of show us what it means to be thinking the same thoughts, doing the same things, and experiencing the same problems. And, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to look at it, but when you're in that moment, it gets super frustrating. And I don't know about you, when I find myself stuck in a rut, I get really angry with myself. Sometimes I wonder, why, why in the world am I like this? Why the heck do I keep doing this? I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. It's like Paul, who was saying, the things that I know I'm supposed to be doing, I don't do. But the things that I know I'm not supposed to be doing, I'm doing them. And we try so hard to change. All of us want to be better fathers, better mothers, better sons and daughters, better teachers, better mentors, better friends. But as much as we try to change ourselves, we still end up doing the things that we hate. And in the process, we find that we start to hate ourselves. We start to hate the fact that we're stuck in this rut and we know we're not supposed to be here. And I think for us, this pandemic has made it so difficult because we're not just dealing with the physical circumstances or the physical challenges, but the emotional and mental long haul of the pandemic. And more and more people are finding themselves stuck in a rut of routine, unproductive thinking because of what researchers now considered the neglected child of mental health. And the most dominant emotion of 2021, that word, languishing. Let me explain. If you can relate to this, let's see. It's not burnout because you still have energy, but you can't seem to label yourself as depressed either because you're not hopeless. Does that make sense? You're, you're not tired, right? Maybe your load is heavy, but you're not really burned out because you still have energy. But you can't say you're super, super in the dumps, depressed, because you, you still feel like there's hope. You're kind of in the middle. You just feel somewhat joyless, aimless, and a sense of blah. So recently, researchers have, have been talking about this, this word languishing because it's somewhere in between thriving and depression. It's a sense of stagnation and emptiness. The term was coined by a sociologist named Corey Keyes, whose research shows that people who are most likely to experience depression and anxiety, order, anxiety disorders in the next decade are the people who are languishing now. And if you can relate to this experience and you've been trying to put your finger on this experience because you don't know what to call it, now we have a word for it. It's called languishing. And part of the danger is that when you're languishing, you might not even notice the dulling of your delight in life. You're not even noticing that your drive is starting to dwindle. You don't catch yourself slipping slowly because, in fact, you are indifferent to your indifference. How dangerous is that, Po? To be indifferent to your indifference. I think for us here as Filipinos, uh, in the United States, it becomes even more difficult for us to talk about mental health because people of different generations, we have different perspectives about mental health, right? So I have an article that's probably going to make you feel uncomfortable. That's okay. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the differences between how Generation Y and Z talk about mental health and the older generation and how hopefully this series will help us to create a space in which we can meet in the middle. The title of this article is How I Learned to Talk to My Filipino Mom About Mental Health. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. So this author was having a really tough summer, writing a book, pulling 14-hour days, wasn't meeting deadlines, not seeing any friends. Most of the time, she was spending her, her day in an unhealthy way, scrolling through the infinite abyss that is social media. I was irritated, isolated, and anxious because for the first time in my life, I started to see or I started to go to counseling sessions. And it was difficult for me to admit to myself that I needed it. So I called the second most important person in the world besides my husband, my mom. On the phone, I listed all my struggles, all my woes, hoping to hear words of support, to which she responded, you don't need to do anything like that. You're completely fine. Imagine what it was like for me. She then recited the story I had heard so many times before. She came alone to this country from the Philippines in the early 1980s. She raised my little sister and me as a single mom, worked two jobs to support us, including working grueling overnight shifts and holidays. Life was hard, really hard. She didn't think that what I was going through was a big deal, 
And this absolutely crushed me. And so it made me think, why did my mom brush my problems aside? I'm 32 and an adult. Why did her opinion matter so much? Why did I feel she did not get it? Why did, she, why did I feel I, she did not get me? You still with me? <laughs> Filipinos care so much about what their family members think. We don't just care about ourselves. We are very much family-centered, and our parents are a, part, are a big part of our lives. So while mental health carries a certain societal stigma or even shame for everyone, for us Filipinos, that shame is doubled. Not only do we want to shame ourselves, but we don't want to bring shame to our family. That stigma may contribute to a startling picture of Filipino mental health here in the United States because the 2015 review has found that Filipino Americans have some of the highest rates of depression amongst Asian Americans. It's us. Another study has found that Filipino American, uh, Filipino -American teenage girls have some of the highest rates of suicidal thoughts in the U.S. And you see, when there's a disconnect between parents and children, you can imagine how isolating that could be. I'll talk to the second gen for a, for a little bit. I think we all, have, we all have had that experience before, right? Maybe we tell our parents something and then they give us an experience of what they went through in the Philippines and we kind of found it difficult to stomach because we felt they did not understand where we were coming from. What the author said was this, maybe it can help those in my generation to see that our, where our parents are coming from. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't love us. It's simply because they have a different experience. My mom may have had a different definition of what hardship means, likely from her own experience as an immigrant and growing up in a lower income country, country a common thread amongst many immigrant cultures in the US. I can't blame my mom for her action, for her reaction. She just had a really different, a different view of mental health, what it means and how to treat it. And by caring so much about what she thought, I was just being a dutiful Filipino daughter, concerned about, my, uh, concerned about her and my family's reputation, but also desiring to foster a more open relationship with my mom. There's redemption. This is the end of the article. So I tried again and I asked her, why didn't she take my trouble seriously when I told her about them this summer? To which my mom replied, I was afraid that I didn't make you strong enough to stand on your own. I wanted you to think maybe that you could overcome it and that this was only a temporary situation. They were lovely words, words I needed to hear from my mom. I just wish I told her you could have said them to me when I was going through a time of depression. Are you still with me? <laughs> I know this is a difficult conversation to have, not just with friends, but across generations. And um, if the most dominant emotion of 2021 is languishing, if the reality that we're facing today as Filipino Americans is we have the highest rate of suicidal thoughts and depression and anxiety amongst Asian Americans, then we must create a space where we can talk about it. Last week's message was all about removing the lies and replacing them with truth. Psychology says when we choose to, to believe a lie about ourselves, it usually falls under one of these three lies. I'm helpless, I'm worthless, and I'm unlovable. Say, no, Pastor Amber, I have different thoughts. No. All those lies that we usually believe about ourselves will fall under one of these three categories. I'm helpless, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable. And because of these lies that we've believed in, we start to develop harmful thought patterns, patterns that you've developed over time that have distorted your perception of reality, right? Oftentimes, what stresses us out is not reality itself, but our perception of it. That's why it's important to be connected with a group of people who can give you a counter voice, who can challenge the possibility that your perspective is not complete. That's why the community is so important. And that is why what makes mental health so difficult is not so much the circumstances we're actually facing, as it is more about the perception of what we're facing. Maybe some of you can relate. Every time you got angry, you lashed out, and perhaps you even got physical in your conflict with those around you. 
Maybe for some of us here, when you got bored, you found yourself mindlessly surfing the internet, going to sites you know you shouldn't be going to. Whenever your mind was filled with thoughts of the future, you projected on others, lashed out on them, yelled at them, got angry. But the truth is the situation was less about what they were doing to you. It was less about their mistakes and more about what you were worried about. Whenever you got envious, you gossip and you talk behind people's backs. This is what you call harmful thought patterns that as you com continue to re and repeatedly think them, leads you to making the same decision and leads you to experiencing the same problems. Craig Rochelle, unless we decide to break the pattern, our lives will continue moving in the wrong direction. Again, unless we decide to break this pattern, and I hope it, for those of us online and if you're on site, let's have the courage to admit that every single one of us has at least one harmful thought pattern that God is saying, I'm inviting you, interrupt that pattern. I'm inviting you. The path towards life means interrupting that thought cycle that you've been stuck in for so many years. Because for so many years of your life, you've believed you were helpless. For so many years in your life, you believed you were unlovable. For so many years of your life, you thought you were unworthy. For so many years in your life, you've allowed anger and envy and lust to define you and to determine who you are. But what if there is a way for us to fight? What if there is a way, by the grace of God, for us to break this pattern? The first step that we need to take to rewire our brains is to understand how our minds work. So I'm going to talk about neuroscience for a little bit, okay? Can you look at the person beside you? Can you slap them? Just kidding, please don't slap them. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, high five, high five, give them a high five. Make sure they're awake. Can you put on your thinking caps, okay? We're just gonna talk about neuroscience for just a minute, okay? So stay with me, Po. A long, long time ago, Researchers thought that when you were born, your brain did not change. But recent discoveries have shown that the brain has an amazing ability to change itself throughout your lifetime. You call this neuroplasticity. The brain is an amazing part of the body. It is so, we don't have time to go through it. It is, it is awesome, the brain, what the brain is able to do. So I'm going to try to talk about the process of neuroplasticity in the simplest way that I can, okay? So let's show the picture. This is a picture of our brains. Lots of different paths. So the different circles refer to brain cells. Okay, stay with me, Paul, brain cells. The way that brain cells communicate with each other is by releasing a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. So every time you think of a thought, when you make a decision, one brain cell communicates to another brain cell. But as you keep thinking that thought, as you keep making that decision, as you keep making that choice, the pathway between those two brain cells gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So in other words, when you repeat something over and over again, right, and you have this mindset, I can stop anytime, but today, okay. But as you continue to have that mindset and you repeat that thought or that decision over and over and over and over again, your mind believes that it is so important it automates it. And mind you, Paul, when the mind automates something, it automates both good and bad repetitions. It doesn't make a distinction between what's good for you and what's bad for you. As long as you're repeating it, it will automate it. That's why a decision that was once very difficult to make now becomes really easy. A decision for you to compromise your integrity at the beginning was so difficult, but now five years later, it's so easy. The more you think something, the more natural it becomes. And with enough repetition, falling into a mental or emotional rut becomes automatic. And you don't even realize envy, lust, anger, greed, negative emotions and thoughts. They're so easy. It's like nothing. You don't even have to try. In other words, you become what you repeat. That's the process of how your brain rewires itself. And what's so difficult Bo, about this process is this. Of the thousands of thoughts, the thoughts that you're thinking right now, hopefully you're engaged and you're not thinking about lunch. 
later on, okay? Don't worry, it's coming. <laughs> of the thousands of thoughts you have every day, it is estimated that 70% of the mental chatter that happens here is negative. Whether that be self-critical, pessimistic, or fearful thoughts. In the words of Charles Spurgeon, pastor of the, the largest church of his time, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, known as the Prince of Preachers, and yes, struggled with depression and talked about it openly on the pulpit. Said, when we face this ancient foe, the devil, there remains only one thing we can do and must do, and that is to fight. Jenny Allen we have bought the lie that we are victims of our thoughts rather than warriors equipped to fight on the front lines of the greatest battle of our generation, the battle for our minds. Are you still with me, Paul? Let's go. Romans chapter 12, the voice version. It says, do not allow this world to mold you in its own image, but instead be transformed from the inside and out by renewing your mind as a result you will be able to discern what god wills and what god finds is good pleasing and complete so the process for of neuroplasticity one author was saying understanding how that process works makes this verse come alive in a different way because the way that god has designed our brain to work is very much aligned with this Rewire your brain by renewing your mind. Create new neural pathways in your brain by renewing your mind. And we will see the renewing of the mind through the Word of God. We'll talk about that later. It is clear that the battleground between conforming to the voices of the world and being transformed from the inside out is within your mind. The place where you feel you have total personal privacy, the place in which you feel no one could invade. And I realized maybe the reason why this topic is so difficult for us to talk about, and maybe for some of us why it's so easy for us to just say whatever with our thought life, is because we underestimate the power of our thoughts. You forget that before something comes out of your mouth, before you make a decision, it passes through here first, even if for just a split second. And whether you decide to counter it or engage in it, it passes through here first. And we underestimate how powerful this is. And that's why Paul here, what he's basically saying is this. A changed life begins with a changed mind. Not changed behavior, not changed movements, not changed emotions. No, it's a changed mind. The first part, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I think what's so interesting about the word confer, conformed is that it is, it, it, it is in the present imperative. Okay, Pastor Amber, what the heck does that mean? I'll explain. <laughs> so, Pastor Amber, I'm a, like a, I love grammar. It's the nerd in me. <laughs> so, I love studying grammar in the scriptures because it, it allows the verses to come alive in ways you never think it will come alive. So the word conf conformed is in the present imperative. And what that means is this. The group of people that Paul was talking to was already engaging in this conforming to the patterns of this world. They were already very much in that lifestyle. The word conformed has the root noun schema, which comes from the English word scheme. A plan or organized program of action, a crafty or secret one that denotes a pattern of life that does not come from within, but is imposed from outside. It reminds me of this fruit. Can we show the picture? The square watermelon. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's really expensive. It's $85 each. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> square, water, square watermelons, you can actually find them in Japan, or they, it started rather in Japan, 
And the reason why Japanese farmers wanted to create square watermelons was because there was this problem of putting a watermelon in your fridge and it's like rolling around. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, I'm serious. That was the problem that they were trying to solve. It was rolling around on the shelf and like, okay, how do we get the watermelon to like stay still? Let's make it a square. <laughs> so what they do, I know it's so interesting, right? I don't know yung talagang wow, square watermelons, right? So what they do is they put the, the seed of the watermelon, or they allow the water, watermelon to grow in a glass cube. In a glass cube. And it's amusing to think of how a naturally round watermelon can become square because of the shape of the container in which it is growing. That's what Paul means when he talks about do not be conformed to the pattern of this world because the, pat the patterns of this world, there is a... It has, the world has its version of a glass cube. You're meant to be a round watermelon, but it's going to force you to become square. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. Second part, verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind or let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Bottom line, the word for transform, you can find the root word in metamorphosis which means changing the essential being of something. So translate that to our conversation today about our thought life. It's not just about us thinking different thoughts. It's about us having new thoughts coming from a new mind, okay? It's not just different thoughts. It's new thoughts coming from a new mind, a mind that was not able to think life-giving thoughts apart from God, who changes the way we think by giving us a new mind, okay? It's not just putting a band-aid on it. No, it's the renewal of your mind. It's certain thoughts that you would not have been able to think on your own apart from God, apart from the grace of God, apart from the Word of God that convicts you through the Holy Spirit. That's why transform, so stay with me. I'm going to talk a little bit more gram grammar, okay? Transformed is also in its present tense. And what that means is this process of changing, it's gradual. It doesn't happen overnight. The need for us to commit our, our minds to the process of renewal needs to happen every day. And lastly, transformed is in its passive voice. And this for me, village, is the most liberating part. Because what it means for the word transform to be in the passive voice is that this process of change is being, is being performed by an outside force and not by self-effort. Bottom line, it's not something you do, but something that is done to us. It's no longer about me trying hard because the more I try, the more I end up doing the things that I hate. And maybe this time, what I need to do is to release and allow God to do what only He can do because only God can give me not just different thoughts, but new thoughts that come from a new mind. And that's why Charles Spurgeon, I love this, he was again going through his bouts of depression and he said this, we plead not ourselves, not our capacity, but the promises of Jesus, not our strengths, but His, not, uh, I'm sorry, our weaknesses, yes, but His mercies because our way of fighting it's to hide behind Jesus who fights for us. That's so beautiful. Yung parang sometimes, alam ko po yan, I've had friends who have gone through depression and mental health, and sometimes I, I, I listen to them, and they say, it's, I fi I'm fighting, I'm doing what I can, but it's hard, I'm tired. And I think what's so liberating about this change, this process of transformation is, it's not, that's, it's not something we do, it's something that is done to us. If we choose the path of surrender and yield, our God promises to give us a new mind because a changed life begins with, uh, sorry, a changed life begins with a changed mind. So it says our way of fighting is to hide behind Jesus who fights for us because look at this, our hope is not the absence of regret. It's not the absence of misery or doubt or lament. It's not even the absence of depression or the absence of anxiety, but the presence of Jesus.
And that's why, what if we genuinely believed it this time? It's like you know the truths of God. You know that God loves you. You know that God cares about us. You know that God fights for you. But I realize that knowing something here is not the same thing as believing it and living in the freedom of that truth and that reality. But what if this time, village, we believed it? That when God says you are worthy, you are loved, and you are enough, we believed it to be true. And what if we believe that, yes, we no longer have to live conformed to the patterns of this world, that we don't have to stay stuck in our patterns of negative actions and reactions, that we can allow the word of God to rewire our minds because we weren't destined to stay the same. We were called to be transformed through Jesus only by his grace. The mind renewed by God through the word will be better prepared to discern the will of God. Right? I know many of us here, one of our biggest questions is, what is the will of God for my life? The path is there. It's in that scripture. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to discern. Then you'll be able to know the will of God and to discover what God finds good, pleasing, and complete. It begins with a, a mind that is renewed. It paves the way for us to be able to discern the will of God. And what's interesting and so powerful about scriptures is that the scripture, the word of God, has a way of acting as a mirror or filter for our desires. I believe this quote is from Charles Stanley. The will of God will not contradict the word of God. And that oftentimes, if we are brave enough and courageous enough to seek God through the word, and allow our minds to be transformed through the Spirit as we go into the Scriptures. Our mind will be able to discern the will of God because distractions are removed that would hinder such discernment. Now, we know this, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is refreshing to the soul. The statues of the Lord, they are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord, they are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Village, we know this. We know that the scriptures refresh the soul. We know that they give wisdom. We know that they give joy to the heart. We know that they give us light. But it's hard, right? Oh, yeah, amen. I heard some, huh. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, uh, uh, a hesitant yes, because you also don't want to admit that you have a hard time prioritizing seeking God through the word, right? But we know, we're, we, we know that this is the gift that God has given humanity for us to understand the nature of God, the love of God, and who he is. We know that the word of God refreshes, gives us wisdom, gives us joy, gives us light. But why is it so difficult? There was this really funny, I have a psych, I'm a psych major, so <laughs> it comes out often every once in a while in mental health. I'm like, man, it's definitely going to come out <laughs> during, during our time together. So I, I came across this experiment where a group of people were given two choices, two. One group, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 everybody in the group was given the exact same two options. Number one. You can sit alone in a room with your thoughts quietly for five minutes. Or two, in intervals, you administer to yourself mild electrical shocks. Can you guess which people would rather do? How many of you say sit alone with their thoughts? With not, not doing anything. It's okay, raise your hands. But how many of you say other people chose the latter? They would rather administer to themselves mild electrical shocks. It's the second one. Yeah, it's the second one, Po. Our brains crave so much stimulation that it's difficult for us to sit alone in a room just with our thoughts that people would rather shock themselves than sit alone with their thoughts. That's how crazy it is. That's how much we hate stillness and silence. And I'm not one to judge because recently I had one of those moments where I found it very difficult to sit in silence. Netflix was on even if I'm not watching it. It's hard for me to drive. You guys are laughing. Why are you laughing? Uh, we're, we're laughing. I see the youth specifically. <laughs> 
You play music for hours in the car or through our headphones because it's hard for you to drive in silence. We pack our schedule with things we should be doing, leaving no room for margin, and we're constantly justifying an on-the-go lifestyle because of a desire to meet expectations of a demanding job. And I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. I find it difficult sometimes but to sit alone in the silence with my thoughts and the Word of God. And for many reasons. Maybe the reason why we choose to stay distracted is this. If I stay distracted, then my doubts and my fears, they're not going to catch up to me. Or if I stay distracted, I'm not going to feel any pain. And my, my fear is this. If I slow down enough to look at my soul, I might be so overwhelmed by all that I need to fix. And maybe for many of us, this is our greatest fear. I don't know if I'm ready or even willing to hear what God wants to say to me. Bottom line, we are afraid to face God, and in turn, we are afraid to fully face ourselves. We are afraid to face God, and in turn, we are afraid to fully face ourselves. And so quiet time with God no longer just becomes quiet in the conventional sense because when you spend time with God, that's when your thoughts come in, right? And we're like those group of, that group of people that were experimented on. I'd rather sit a, a, in a room and administer mild electrical shocks to me than be alone with my thoughts. And so quiet time with God no longer just becomes quiet in the conventional sense in that when we choose to spend time with God, then we have nothing to do, but we are forced to face ourselves. And upon hearing the word of God and the voice of God, hopefully to free ourselves from that which holds us back. Village Po, before we can free ourselves, we have to first and foremost have the courage to face ourselves. Whatever thoughts have, have, have been binding for you, the lies that have, that have been binding for you for so many years. Before we can free ourselves, we must first and foremost face ourselves. And there is nothing like coming to God in the presence of God that allows us to see ourselves in its fullness. Not just the good, but the bad, the ugly, and the broken. I use the word ruminate. This is from Greg, Craig Rochelle. The process of renewing your mind involves ruminating on God's word. Okay, what does ruminating mean? Okay, so can we show the, the, the first picture, the first diagram? So I showed this to us earlier, right? It's a thick arrow from one brain cell to another. That means that thought or that habit is so oftentimes repeated, it's automatic. But this time we're choosing to rewire our brain. We're choosing to say, this is my trigger. It's when I'm alone. It's when I'm afraid. It's when I'm failing. It's when I'm in a group of people. Acknowledge what your trigger is. This is my trigger. And this is my thought, which leads to this action, which leads to this experience. And then it repeats itself over and over again. So this arrow signifies a thought that you keep repeating because eventually we become what we repeat. Now, next picture. This is an image of us fighting to create new neural pathways in our mind, saying that white arrow, it's got to go. Because this is, the, this is the destructive thought pattern, and I need to counter it with a new thought. So as you continue to use this pathway, let's go third, the third picture. It leads to a new, new habit, a new thought, a new action. Now, the reason why I show this to us is because cows, do you know when cows eat po, they ruminate? Do you know what it means to ruminate on something? So basically, what that means po is cows get a mouthful of grass, chew it up, swallow it, throw it back up again in their mouth, chew it some more, swallow it again, throw it back up, chew it some more, swallow it again, throw it back up, chew it some more, <laughs> Swallow it again, over and over and over again. Can you imagine eating, let's say, oh my gosh, I don't know why this is the first food that comes out, In-N-Out, In-N-Out burger. 
okay? You eat it in and out, it's a double-double, and you're eating it, right? And then you chew it, and then you swallow it, and then you throw it back up. But you don't throw it up. You don't throw it out of your mouth. You keep it in your mouth. And then you chew it again. <laughs> and then you throw it back up, and you do that process over and over and over again. So that's what you call the process of ruminating. And the reason why cows ruminate is because they want to get the maximum amount of nutrition in the grass that they're eating. So Craig Rochelle was saying, this is the same thing when it comes to reading the word of God. Because I don't know about you, but we all have to start somewhere, right? Maybe five minutes in the morning, like casually reading the Bible, right? And then it comes to a point where you say, okay, I checked it off. Awesome. I did what I was supposed to do. <laughs> But the truth is we're not ruminating on the word of God when we are, maybe for you it involves studying the context. Maybe for you it's, a pastor says, when you, read, when you read a passage, try to make 50 observations about it. And I was like, 50? That sounds so impossible. <laughs> and he's like, no, try it. 50 observations of a single passage. Maybe for you it's reading it slowly. Maybe for you it's when you read a verse and something you can feel there's a tension inside of you, you need to pause and ask yourself, why is this scripture jumping out? What, what is the Lord trying to tell me through this verse or even through this word? So I think what's so beautiful about the process of renewing our mind is that it involves ruminating on the word of God. So when you think of ruminating, think of the cow, think of the in and out burger. I don't know if this is helping. I hope it is. <laughs> And apply it to the word of God, meditating on God's word, that you chew it up, you swallow it, and then again, over and over and over and over and over again. Because if 70% of our mental chatter is negative, 70%, then this scripture is so important. Maybe this is why Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 4. It says, fix your thoughts. Because all of us here, Paul Village, you have something that you fixate on. How do you know? Ask yourself, what's the first thing? You'll say you wake up, what's the first thing you think about? Going to the restroom. No, no, I mean like, of course, obviously, doing your business in the morning. But beyond that, when you wake up, what's the first thing you think about? Who is the first person you think about? When you sleep, what's the last thing you think about? Who is the last person you're thinking about? You ask yourself these questions because every single one of us, we have something or someone, a pursuit, a dream, a fear, a doubt, a question that we're constantly fixated on. We're obsessed about it. We dwell on it. And it comes up during random times of the day when you're not even thinking about it. It's so automatic for you. And that's why Paul here is saying, fix your thoughts on what is true, on what is honorable, on what is right, on what is pure and lovely. Think about things that are excellent and worthy. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Now, Craig Groeschelpo puts it so beautifully. It begins with a thought. It leads to an action, and then the experience of God follows. From the thought to action to the experience of the peace of God. But oftentimes, we undervalue that first step. We underestimate the power of fixing our thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Because if repetition is the reason why we find ourselves falling into ruts, then we must choose what to fixate on. Does that make sense, Paul? <laughs> Are you still with me, Paul? Yes? Okay. <laughs> there is a new field of study called neurotheology. It's very interesting. Neurotheology seeks to understand the relationship between the brain and prayer, meditation, other practices. Both. Now, secondary to the spiritual impact of time alone with God, according to the emer emerging field of neurotheology, quiet, quiet meditation literally changes our brain. So, okay, let's go back to this image. So, you see this brain, this picture of the brain, Paul? So, 
baseline scan is when a person is at rest, okay? The prayer scan is when a person is engaging in prayer or meditation, reading the Word of God, okay? So there's a reason why. You see that arrow, Bo, and it points to the parietal lobe. Do you see it, Bo, parietal lobe? So bottom line, Bo, the parietal lobe is the part of the brain that gives us the sense of self, our sense of self, okay? And what's interesting is that when people engage in time of prayer and meditation, activity in the parietal lobe decreases. What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? It's when you find yourself engaging in the presence of God, engaging in prayer, engaging in a time of meditation, your sense of self lessens. The ego, selfishness, self-centeredness. It's, it's so interesting because it is a depiction of that desire, of that prayer of our hearts to say, God, more of you and less of me. I think it's really cool to see it, that it happens in our brain. That when you find yourself united and, at one, and, and, and one with God, you see it in your brain. Because the part of your brain that is responsible for your understanding of self more so self-centeredness, the ego, the activity there decreases. And that desire for us to say, God, more of you, less, huff me. For some of us here, perhaps we have become so busy doing things for God that we have forgotten what it means to be with him. We are so busy doing so many things for God that we have forgotten what it means to be with God. That's why in Psalm chapter 84 is a beautiful, beautiful verse. Because a lot of us, but we, we would rather be somewhere else. We would rather be doing something else. But what's so powerful about this is more than any other place in the world, where you are is where I want to be. Verse 10, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. I don't know about you, Po, but when I find myself, I know that I am experiencing the joy of what it means to be in the presence of God, whether that be prayer or allowing my mind to be renewed through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, the ego, the sense of I, it starts to disappear. It becomes, Lord, more of you and less of me. Philip Yancey, when I pray, it may seem that I am narrowing my world. It may seem as if I am retreating from the real world into a prayer closet in Jesus' metaphor. But actually, I am entering another world just as real but invisible, a world that has the power to change me and the world I seem to be retreating from. Because regular prayer helps me to protect inner space, to prevent the outer world from taking in. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, Jesus said. And when I think of how long a single image crafted by Hollywood lust masters can live on in my mind, I understand his saying. So often I fill my mind with images that crowd out all room for God. Prayer involves the renewing of the mind, a two-stage process of purging out what displeases God and damages me, which coincidentally is the same thing and allows God to fill my mind with what matters far more. How are we going to counter 70% village of, of negative mental chatter? In our own strength, I know this and you know this. We can't do it on our own. That's why what Charles Spurgeon said was so important. It's not me fighting, but hiding behind Jesus who fights for me and allowing myself to go through this difficult yet necessary process of God, what are the thoughts that displease you? What are the thoughts that damages me? Because it turns out they're the same thing. And God, 
Can you allow my mind to be filled with the things that matter more? I'd like to end po with a last story po. What's interesting po about the experience of pressure, right? I think all of us know what it's like to, have, to be pressured, whether that's pressure to do well in school, pressure to do well in work, pressure to be the provider of your household, pressure to be the quote-unquote strong person because everybody expects you to be strong. But more often than not, because that expectation is placed on your shoulder, there are actually more moments where you find yourself so weak and broken. And that pressure, Michael, Mike Todd book, He said the pressure that we experience in life is what allows us to identify whether we have the presence of fear or the peace of God. What's interesting about pressure, it it shows what's really inside. Is it the presence of fear or is it the peace of God? Cindy McLaughlin, she just won her second gold medal, right? (laughs) Yesterday, (laughs) woohoo, with Allison Felix, her her final relay, I, I heard it was an emotional time for people. It's the last time that Allison Felix, who is also a Christian, passed, passed the baton. She qualified for the 2016 Rio Olympics, but she placed fifth in the semifinals and did not medal. She went from an ordinary teenager to an international recognized star overnight. And I think you know what it's like when you're up on stage or maybe you feel like everybody's looking at you. So at this time that she became the superstar of an athlete, everyone suddenly had an opinion about her, what you should be doing. This is how you should say things. This is what you're supposed to wear. This is what you're supposed to be, uh, this is how you're supposed to be carrying yourself out in public. Life after Rio was another major hurdle and an adjustment so great that for the first time, McLaughlin actually contemplated quitting track. And again, mind you, she was only a teenager. It's worth noting that, again, Pastor Edwin mentioned this last week, that for many Olympians, the abrupt return to an ordinary life leads to what you call post-Olympic depression because your purpose is so tied down to that Olympic gold or that medal count. But like, again, what Naomi Osaka said, if you know me, I'm a good tennis player, but if I'm no longer a good tennis player, then who am I? In McLaughlin's case, her adjustment was compounded with hatred online. Haters spewing things like, you went all the way to Rio and you didn't meddle? What's the point of even, even, of even going there? As she experienced teen bullies in real life. It was definitely difficult because I think you know this, people say, don't worry about it. But the truth is, you do worry. We hear that, that phrase, you're not supposed to care about what other people think. But the truth is, we do care. And village, I think what's so difficult about that is you don't even want to admit to yourself that you care because it seems so trivial and small. And then you hate yourself for caring. And it leads you to this vicious cycle that you can't seem to get out of. She was a 17-year-old. She cared about how other people perceived her. She wanted people to like her. She struggled with identity. And she couldn't help but be caught in the web of social media obsessing over likes and follower counts. And you're probably listening to me and you're saying, that doesn't faze me. But the truth is, we're we're probably oblivious to the pull of social media, even in our own lives, for us to have the courage to admit, what people think about me on social media, I care about it. I know I'm not supposed to, but I do. Eventually, her secret was her parents, who retrained her focus on what was important reminded her that her gift in track was a gift, that it has a purpose, and that it's meant to be used, shown, and shared. Her training eventually paved off as she sprinted to a world record at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials. With a new record, eventually training for the Olympics, the pandemic hit, and for the longest time, McLaughlin believed that she believed that track was her whole life. But when the pandemic hit, her time in isolation forced her to reflect and she saw room for change. So these insights is a mixture of interviews and her Instagram posts. Being home by myself helped me to grow in my faith, which helped me to get through the pandemic. It helped me understand that my identity is not found in whether I win or lose a race, what place I get, or how much money I make. Look at this. It's It's the opposite of the question of Naomi Osaka. 
last Sunday. You remember? Her struggle was, I am what I do. But look at what McLaughlin says. Track is not who I am. It's simply something I do. It's the opposite, but you see it? Some days, the friendships and support are through the roof. Others, you wouldn't even know it was there, especially in a world full of inconsistency. It's a breath of fresh air to find true stability in Jesus. As humans, we are constantly shifting our efforts towards each other, shifting emotions, shifting circumstances. The peace of knowing I will always have a friend, always have his support, always have his love makes even the loneliest of moments feel full. It is the love of God that allows me to sit in a room by myself with my thoughts. Because with everything in the world that is changing, it is God and His love who is not changing. It is, it is constant. The presence of God and the love of God, it is a constant in our lives. My soul finds rest in knowing that God is not like us. Us who shift in our emotions, who shift in our moods, who are constantly changing. He does not change and He will never, he will never leave me. Giving the ability to be completely content no matter the situation simply because I don't have to face it alone. That is love. I'd like for us to end with a final song. This is based off the scripture that I read to you earlier. If we want to rewire our brain village, we need to start by, re by allowing the Lord to renew our mind through the word of God. And oftentimes, yes, we would rather do other things, other things that we feel would give us more tangible results. But then a, come, a, a point in time will come in our lives where we'll realize amidst everything that is changing in our world, there is one whose presence and love will never change. And uh, I hope that that would be the prayer of our hearts as well if you've ever found yourself like a Charles Spurgeon, I hope that this is a time in which you would surrender to God this battle, not because you've given up, okay? There's a difference, with, there's a difference in the way the scripture describes surrender. Eh? When we say surrender, that doesn't mean you've given up on life. When you say surrender, it is us finally yielding to the will of God that is good, pleasing, perfect, and complete. It is us yielding to the ways of God and acknowledging, I can't do this by myself. I can't, I can't fight this battle of depression on my own. I can't do it. But maybe it starts not by doing things more, doing more things for God, but just choosing to be with Him. So there's a song that I grew up listening to and it's a song that reminds us that there is no other place that compares than to be in the center of the presence of God. Let's listen to the song. Better is one day, 
Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts And thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts And thousands elsewhere my heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, and thousands elsewhere. Better is, better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, and thousands elsewhere. Better is one day. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, a thousand elsewhere, a thousand elsewhere. I'd like to invite all of us to stand up wherever you are online or on site as we pray uh, this coming uh, Saturday, a few, a few weekends from now, August 28 at 10 a.m. PDT is our local, or our, rather our anchored global edition. We just recently had our Alta Summer program and um, it still surprises me, even though I know it shouldn't. Um, when I ask our young people, what was your highlight during the entire summer, I expect answers like the games, the fun stuff, the laughter, the little the party dance, the dance parties that we have. Well, we have a lot of those during the summer. And I, I still get very surprised when I hear young people say that their favorite time of, of the entire two weeks of coming together was our moments of Selah. That basically refers to the hour that we have at the beginning of, of every day where we have a short message. We, have, we give them 30 minutes to read the Bible and then we come together and we ask for their insights and then we pray together. And uh, every year I find myself um, pleasantly surprised that this is, that, that that moment of the entire, entire summer was their highlight. And maybe for so many of us, you can relate that it's been a really long time. It's the summer. You were on vacation. You were doing all kinds of things. Pinnacle Village has also been very busy. We've been doing a lot of things. And it's like, it's been a while since you've really sat down and really allowed God to bring to the surface issues destructive thought patterns, problems that you've shelved away for the longest time. During our time of Anchored, we have those designated moments where as a village, we pray together, we come together with our own insights. Um, and it's always a very powerful and refreshing experience from everyone, for everyone. 
If you've never experienced Anchored before, we'd like to invite you to join us August 28th, Saturday. Here in Los Angeles, we will also be meeting on site if you're interested. Bay Area, we will also be meeting on site there. PV House in the East Coast, we will also be meeting on site there. For those of us who are not comfortable yet coming on site, you are free to join us online. And like what Pastor Derek said, the global edition of Anchored is so special because you get to hear stories and struggles from our people outside of the U.S., outside of North America. Stories of what is it like to live as a Filipino in the Philippines during a time of a pandemic? Or what is it like living as a Filipino in the Middle East during a pandemic? What someone, a, 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 a Pinoy in Europe, what are their struggles? What do they pray about? And somehow being exposed to their stories, it makes our worlds bigger, puts our own life into a different perspective and reminds us the faithfulness of our God, not just in our life, but in the lives of those around us. And it's so encouraging. So Village, if you haven't joined us before, we highly encourage you, take this time, prioritize it, make it a date between you and uh, with, with your entire family. Parents, bring your children along. Youth, let's prioritize this. We're starting school very soon and the grind is going to start and we don't want to begin a new school year without a message from God that will hold us and carry us through the challenges of a new year. So let's come before the Lord, but let's enter into a time of prayer. Today we talked about rewiring our brains by allowing God to renew our minds. Before we start, um, can you use this time to bring before God one? I know you have a lot, but bring up one. One habitual, consistent, destructive, and dangerous thought pattern that is present in your life right now. Don't think hypotheticals, this is not about what ifs, no. The presence of thought patterns that are destructive and detrimental to your life now, at this moment. Is it doubt? Is it anger? Is it one of those three lies? Bottom line, God, I just feel I'm like I'm helpless or I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, I'm not enough? Is it resentment? Is there bitterness that has led you to make the same decision over and over and over again? Is it envy that has served as your filter, the lens through which you see the world, the lens through which you relate with the people around you? What is it? Spell it out. God, for the longest time, this is the lie that I've been believing. For the longest time, this is the thought that has been binding me. And maybe for some of us, you're indifferent. I know my, my, my friends who've gone through depression, they, they sometimes say that they don't feel anything at all. If that's you, then say it tell God don't sugarcoat anything rewiring our our brains begins by us having the courage to admit this is where I am right now Father, we think that our minds is a place of complete, total privacy. No one can see what's going on in there. And that may be true because the people around us may never know the fullest extent of what we think about. And Father, we can probably fool others and even ourselves, but we can't fool you. Because you see every thought that comes into our mind. 
you see every negative mental chatter that enters our minds. In the moments that we are self-critical, in the moments that we are afraid and we can't admit to other people that we're scared, but the truth is we're so scared. But Father, we thank you because we know that in engaging the battle for our minds, we were, not, we were never meant to fight this battle on our own. We were never meant to fight this battle with our own strength. Because the more that we tried, the harder it became. The more that we tried to stop something that we were repeatedly doing over and over and over and over again, the more difficult it was for me to change. But this time, this time I want to say it will be different. Not because of anything I'm doing, but because this time I'm choosing the path of surrender. And when I say that, it's not because I'm giving up on life. It's because this time I'm yielding to you. This time, God, I ask that you would allow me to hide behind you who fights for me. And that, Lord, in the moments, oh God, that I read my scriptures, I read the Bible, help me to create new thoughts when I'm triggered. Help me to create new habits when I'm triggered. Help me to develop new thought patterns, life-giving thoughts. And help me to understand there is no better place in this world where all of that could happen than in your presence. Because indeed, better is one day in your courts better is one day where you are than the thousands elsewhere. Father, we thank you for today. Alam po namin that this process of trans transformation will not happen overnight. But Father, we thank you because we know that even right now, you're already moving, you're already changing us, you're already renewing us so that we would think not just different thoughts, but new thoughts that come from a new mind. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for Pinnacle Village. This topic is a really uncomfortable topic. And maybe some of us here, we have a hard time talking about it with our parents. And even for us as parents, it's hard for us to understand where our kids are coming from. But Father, we ask that you would allow love and grace to take the lead so that we would seek to under understand each other and help one another overcome our struggles when it comes to mental health. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity to worship you. We lift up to you, O oh God, even our tithes and our love offerings as we give them to you with thankful hearts, knowing that you're able to provide always for the needs of your work. Marami salamat po. And to you we give all glory, all honor, and praise. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thanks for watching. If you like that clip and you want to watch more of the full message, go ahead to go to our website, which is at pinnaclevillage.org. And also, thank you for helping us reach 1,000 subscribers. Now help us reach 2,000 by go ahead clicking that subscribe button, smash the like button, and turn on your notifications so you don't miss any of the videos. And if you also want to share this video, we have discussion questions on the description box below for you to talk about with your friends, family, and loved ones. Because here at Pinnacle Village, we believe and practice our lives are stronger when connections are deeper. See you next time.